thank you guys for doing this. I'm sure you hear this every day of every week, or at least in every interview, but as long as I've been alive and aware of music, I've known your music. So oh, that's that awesome. For the decades of memories right there. And I believe you have a rock and roll fantasy camp workshop coming up in a couple of days. Did you pitch them or did David and team pitch you? I've known David um, ever since the Dirty Dancing um, play. It's not really a play. It was a, uh, a concert that he put on back in like 1988, 89. And it was touring the country. And I met him at the, uh, uh, in New York, at Radio one of those City days. Music Hall, I think. Bing, bingo. Radio City, that's exactly where I met him. And so through the years, you know, uh, I've known him and I saw his camps and a friend of mine actually started some of that camp, um, Mark Rivera, who's a oh, sax yeah. player. For Billy Joel's band. Ringo, yeah. Yeah. And so Mark and I have written a lot of songs together and we're friends for years and years and years. And then I saw that uh, David Fischoff took over the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. So I thought I would give him a shout and just say, you know what, John and I would like to do something really cool and different. And uh, we would like to kind of like break the song down and, and um, you know, let John put up the multi-track and we could talk to songwriters about how the song was created. Mm -hmm. And then we would like to give all the proceeds to the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, which in Patrick Swayze's honor. And so, in doing that, we started thinking outside of the box, how could we make this show even better? And Lisa Swayze, Patrick's widow, said that she would like to join us. So she's gonna be with us tomorrow. It's uh, uh, eight o'clock uh, Eastern time. And uh, rockcamp.com slash masterclass. So that's how you can get a hold of us. And we're gonna have a lot of fun. We're gonna probably uh, talk about all your dirty dancing secrets. Sure, now, John, do you have a rehearse story as to how you two met? If, in other words, do you both have the same exact recollection of the first time that you two met? Well, yeah, probably because uh, it was through a, a mutual friend of ours that had a recording studio in uh, in his basement <laughs> in um, Montclair, New Jersey. Mont Montclair, yeah. New Jersey. Yep. A guy named David Prater, and um, I had known. David for years we had played in bands together and um, Frankie and I uh, separately were working with David at his studio. Uh, Frankie was working on some new stuff for uh, new Frankie and the Knockouts record and right. I was working on some songs just in general and um, David played the music uh, of Hungry Eyes which was kind of almost like a pretty you know pretty complete musical piece you know, without a, a melody and, and lyric um, it, but it would have all the chime dun, 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 and all that stuff so um, uh, David and David put us together basically David uh, introduced us through that song really and that was the first song Frank and I wrote together was Hungry Eyes which was, for, which was for Frankie and the Knockouts' fourth album, right. which uh, never happened. Uh, not too many record labels heard that as a hit record, you know, and um, it took uh, a, move, a movie like uh, Dirty Dancing and, you know, somebody like Eric Carmen yes. from the Raspberries and Jimmy Einer, who, who was the president of the label Frankie and the Knockouts was on, uh, used to produce the Raspberries, and that's the connection of Eric Carmen to the song and to me and to, and to John. I, I've had the pleasure of interviewing Eric Carmen just as I have David no, Fishoff. Okay. I'm sure we know a lot of the same people in different yeah, 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 yeah. ways and all that. But I had no idea about how low budget and troubled Dirty Dancing was until I saw that documentary on Netflix called uh, The Films That Made Us or The Movies That Made Us, whatever it was called. One thing I was curious about is the two songs that you guys had them in the movie, were those the only two that you had submitted? Or was there like another six that, you know, you submitted and didn't make it? Uh, it's interesting. Uh, when Jimmy had called me, we were one of 150 songs that were submitted for that last scene. 
And so when I met Patrick Swayze at the Academy Awards, he was like all over me, you know, who signed the demo? Who wrote what? And I said, what's going on, Pat? And he goes, well, you know, we had listened to 149 songs and turned them all down. We were getting ready to film the last scene. And in doing so, the last scene was filmed first for some reason. They filmed that a sequence. Yeah. And he said, we just didn't have a song. We didn't really think too much of the movie. We just wanted to get it over with. And Emil Ardolino at that time walked in and was, wait, 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 we got one more cassette, the 150th. We might as well listen to it. So yeah, all right, put it in. He goes, we started listening to that song. Everyone got up and started dancing. We're making a movie to that. And so they, Kenny Ortega, who was the uh, choreographer, right. had to kind of change all the dance steps. And they filmed that day. And he said, at the end of the day, we just looked at each other. What, what the hell just happened? Let's go make a movie. You know, cool. so it inspired, you know, them. And in doing so, helped create the phenomenon. Now, credit goes to both of you guys because your careers did not start with Dirty Dancing and it did not end with Dirty Dancing, to say the least. You know, John, I know who Kara's Flowers is. I, I was a fan of Kara's Flowers in 1998, 1999, maybe wow. a little before that, before they gave, became Maroon 5. I'm now, impressed. Well, thank you. I, I love me some power pop. And Kara's <laughs> Flowers was a great power pop band before it became Maroon 5. Exactly. So, John, as a Long Island native, did you have anything to do with Adam Levine going to Five Towns College on Long Island? No, no. They, uh, we had uh, kind of stopped speaking at that point. We, we, um, I, I think they, they, they put that Kara's Flowers record out on Warner Brothers yes. um, through um, Rob Cavallo, and it didn't take off. So they were kind of disappointed and broke up for a short time. And uh, I think just the two of them went, uh, just Jesse and uh, Adam, Jesse Carmichael and Adam went to Five Towns and um, they had, a, you know, they got a, a bit more of the East Coast influence um, with rhythmic and soulful stuff. And, and they reformed the same four guys and they added the James, the guitarist. Yes. Uh, number five and uh and um they kind of you know changed it wasn't as power poppy uh, you know it was more uh, i don't know what you would call it uh, well you know soul r and b yeah but it wasn't <laughs> but it was somewhere in between you know because it was kind of guitar based exactly you know, still so uh but i i you know we could see that um that adam had the goods i mean he was sure. just i mean i tell you he would pick up a, the guitar and play a solo like we wanted something out there and he would just play this perfectly out solo you know and he's just he's just a very natural musician Gifted. yeah Definitely very, a gifted performer and musician and multi-instrumentalist can play the drums and all no. that but but back to you guys because the credit goes <laughs> to you guys and all that Something that is amazing to me isn't just the greatness of I've Had the Time of My Life and Hungry Eyes, but how these songs have continued to get licensed in commercials, get covered, get sampled. The Black Eyed Peas song, of course, now you hear that at all the bar mitzvahs and the, <laughs> and the weddings. But what I'm curious about is if you guys turned down a lot of things over the years. I think some, um, you know, we have a publicist, I mean, a, uh, uh, a publisher who administrates our publishing, Michelle Bougere, at International Royalties. And, you know, she'll come to us with a myriad of different products. And so we would like, you know, to keep the integrity of the song. And so, yeah, we have turned down, you know, some commercials that, and some parodies and things like that for both songs, Hungry Eyes as well. Um, you know, just, you know, you want to keep the integrity of the song. It won an Academy Award. So you don't want to tarnish that. And then having that huge, huge level of success. Now, I know that Tico Torres was in Frankie and the Knockouts. Right. John Bon Jovi was one of the first rock artists to use outside songwriters. Does that mean that you guys 
the camp that you almost wrote with Kiss or Bon Jovi, et cetera? Um, you know, having Tico uh, being Frankie in the Knockouts uh, be my friend for, you know, over 30 years, <clears throat> you know, um, you got, you got your dog going crazy there, John. Uh, somebody's here snow blowing, so. <laughs> it's we COVID. Like, All rules go like, out the window. <laughs> we have like three feet here. We have a lot of snow. Three feet of snow. Oh, yeah. my God. We had about two inches down the shore. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. So, um, you know, opportunities to write with different people. Uh, you know, John and I both – have had that luck, you know, John, with uh, John Wade and, and uh, yeah. a myriad of other people. Uh, you know, me with Cindy Lauper and uh, Earth, Wind and & Fire and, and Fleetwood Mac and Dave Mason. So those opportunities, you know, came to us via the success of our songwriting. You know, I, I think at a certain point, me being an artist um, kind of turned the page of me being an artist and winning an Academy Award, I became a songwriter. You know, it just kind of flicked the switch. And all of a sudden, there I was, Frankie Forever, the songwriter. And a lot of people not correlating Frankie and the Knockouts, Frankie Previtt, time of my life. So, you know, ever since then, 30 years later, I keep connecting the dots. That makes sense. John, in, in your case, when you have big hits like this, <laughs> Does that drive you to go, I want to have hits that are two times bigger? Or did it let you kind of relax and then approach music with less pressure? Yeah, you know, at, at first, you, you know, you try and, uh, first you try and match it. You know, you, you try and, um, God. Uh, but, um, you know, you know, I, I, I guess, not so long after that, I started working with John Waite. We did a bunch of songs. In fact, we just, we just contacted each other recently and realized we have a bunch of songs that we wrote uh, that were his, for his record, um, A Temple Bar, that he was revisiting. And so it's kicked off a new record. He's, we're writing uh, or kind of rehashing the songs we had that didn't make it to that record. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, Eddie Money. Um, and the, but after a while, it, you know, it's, it's a very closed um, thing. You know, if, you're not, if you're not one of Sony's songwriters, you mm -hmm. know, it's a lot harder to get the gig um, than if you're a Sony writer, if it's a Sony artist that's looking for a song. So, I mean, uh, over time after, you know, uh, different successes, I, I also became um, more interested or at least as interested in uh, engineering and producing records, which is what I turned to. And uh, kind of in between the songwriting, you write, then you go produce a mm -hmm. record and then you come back, to, you know, give, freeze up your mind uh, by switching like that, I, at least for me it did. Uh, and you talk about power pop. I don't know if you're familiar with the size because yeah. we, that was uh, there on my label and I, I did a, a number of records with them. Uh, a power pop band that, you know, should have taken off. I mean, they had they did have the one single that was a pretty big hit, Think About Soul, but but there was um, at the time of Nirvana and all that. So they, were, they weren't rough enough, you know, and power pop guys like me and you, had to take a back seat for those few years. But um, um, so, I mean, uh, it's, it's both Frankie and I are, you know, 35 years later, still able to be in the music business and mm -hmm. do projects that we like. And, and um, so in that way, we're, uh, you know, really lucky and, and blessed really by, by these, by that introduction, you know, that, that was my first published song was, was Hungry Eyes. But again, also, your career didn't well, start or end there. And that's just a beautiful thing. But I cut you off, Frankie. What were you saying? I was going to say that, you know, it also opened opportunities via Michael Lloyd, who produced Time of My Life, who um, went on to, you know, Michael does a lot of musical directing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, John and I were lucky enough to have some songs in a, in a film called Avenging Angelo. And um, I had other songs in other movies um, the uh, Frankie and the Knockouts, you know, 
being able to get songs heard that way because it's like John said, very difficult to, you know, be in the click of, you know, a Sony artist or a, a BMG artist sure. that, you know, their publishing companies want to place their songs in those albums. Sorry, my phone's ringing. <laughs> I've heard that song before, sure. <laughs> Sorry about that. No problem at all. I, I th That reminds me of one time when I was interviewing Gene Simmons in person and, you know, he wanted to show me something on his phone and he takes out his phone and has a Kiss cell phone case on it. And you go, that oh. makes perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? That's funny. That's funny. So anyway, you know, opportunities open, you know, the doors open for us. People heard our music with different ears. Mm -hmm. You know, you still had to have the goods, but at least you got it on the other side of the door. Yeah, well, I would imagine uh, <laughs> that, again, a lot of people have that kind of head and they have to go, I'm going to make the things that are two, twice as many as that. And you, you get the Dr. Luke's and the Desmond Childs who have to have the new statistics of like, well, I've had a number one hit for seven decades now. And you hear that and credit to them for that work ethic. Yeah, but it seems like in your cases that you kept creating, but focus more on what you wanted to do as, a tr as opposed to trying to replicate the success. I think it's really difficult. And John could probably attest to this. Uh, the pinnacle of our careers is, is winning these awards. And that year it was, a, it was an Academy Award, a Golden Globe, a Grammy nomination, and one of my favorite awards, ASCAP Song of the Year, the most played song in the world. So it's really hard to top that. You know, so I'm, I'm pretty happy with being me and, and doing stuff that I enjoy doing. And I, John, what, what do you feel? No, the same way. I, 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 you know, I, I enjoy where I'm at right now almost more than ever. I, um, I just put a record out for the first time in my life uh, on my own. Um, and uh, I'm having a, a blast with that. I mean, I, John, I you, gotta, you gotta tell him about Hungry Eyes. That's one of my favorite songs on your new record. <laughs> it's awesome. He did a version of Hungry Eyes that's killing. Yeah, I don't know if you heard it, Darren, but it's, uh, it's actually on the um, AC charts as we speak. And uh, we did a video for it. Uh, you know, I just uh, revisited uh, a bunch of my songs, including some of the John Waite songs and uh, four songs I wrote with Frankie, um, including one that Frankie mentioned that was in the Avenging Angelo movie, You're the Only One. And uh, I, I'm having a blast with it. I'm, I'm already working on some new stuff for, you know, for the next record. And, but, but I, I also, um, this allowed me to, to be able to go and discover Akara's Flowers or The Size or, or, you know, or different bands that I've worked with through or the- yourself. Or yourself. Or myself, discover myself. In a way that it is, you know, after all these years, yeah, the, the most fun, the reason I think I'm having the most fun is because I've defined myself to myself, yeah. who I am as an artist. And, and it's funny because um, I did a lot of jazz fusion in the earlier years. I, in fact, a band called Flight was sampled. It was on, we were on Motown, sampled by Erica Badu for her hit back in the day. And um, so... Um, you know, it, I don't know where I was going with that one. I lost my train of thought on that one. Well, just that you, you know, you, you opened up the doors that you're an artist now and you, you're able right, to, right. you know, be able to right. spread your wings and feel good about yeah. hearing your I, voice. I know where I was going. I had a, a ton of rock influence too, but I find my, um, when stuff that's coming out of me now has more of like a, almost a 70s soul stylistics kind of thing, which is <laughs> kind of unexpected. I, I, That's that falsetto that you use. I guess, <laughs> I guess it's forcing me into that. But these melodies are coming to me and they're, they're, they're like that. So, uh, you know. So what know. happened to Kara's Flowers is kind of happening to you. You went from being a rock guy to a soul guy. I guess. Guy, really. <laughs> I guess so, yeah. Maybe I'll have the same success. You know, I, I, the other thing too is, you know, at this point, I, yeah. I'm just putting music out yeah. for, for 
my soul. <laughs> you know, if, if people like it, great. Uh, if they hear it, great. But uh, it's, you know, we're not under the gun. Frankie and I are under the gun at all, in any way. I mean, that we were lucky enough to have the success we did and it continues to create a, an income. Um, and um, so we're, we're able to kind of do what, what we want to do. I mean, yeah, Frank, you basically uh, answered the next two questions, which I had, which is that Diane Warren finally announced her first solo album. I don't know if it's a late 2020 or an early 2021. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. And Desmond Child just announced like he's back as a recording artist. Yeah. So in those cases, you don't know if it was out of necessity because they're getting fewer cuts or they just kind of figured, well, I got to express myself. You answered that when you were going to have a solo album, which is now. And if you were going to be cutting any of your back catalog. So well done. And I cut off Frankie again. <laughs> well, you know, basically, you got, you're in the, in the throes of a pandemic and you have a lot of time on your hands. Sure. So, sure. you know, you're sitting there and what do you do best? But, you know, write songs and what do you have? A lot of time, yeah. you know? Well, that's so, true. you know, you kind of sit down and, and, you know, these things come out of you. Maybe that wouldn't have come out of you mm -hmm. if the pandemic wasn't here and you were off living your life like you normally did. So, you know, we'll hopefully come out on the other side of normal and, and uh, you know, have these other things, other career moves that we've made because of the pandemic. You know, that's what that I think. Sense to me. That makes sense to me. So if this Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp workshop goes well, do you think we might see a second one or you doing similar workshops elsewhere? Uh, I did talk to David Fishoff about that. Um, he said, let's see how this first one goes. And, you know, uh, Stacey Worlitz, who wrote uh, She's Like the Wind with Patrick Swayze, that's in the movie, mm -hmm. you know, has been back and forth with me, you know. And uh, I even got a, um, a, a text from Jennifer Gray the other day. So they, they would be great guests, you know, on, on future uh, Rock Camp shows. So um, it's starting to stir uh, s some uh, recognition. And I think the Patrick Swayze and pancreatic cancer connection, um, I think people are empathetic and sympathetic to what happened. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, I know it's Christmas and we're in a pandemic and money is tight, but, you know, the gift of giving and healing through music uh, is what we're trying to do. Well, do you guys have time for two quick questions and then you're free for me? Sure. First question is out of nowhere, but who is the best lead singer of Van Halen? Sammy Hagar. Frankie says, Hagar, John, what do you say? I'm going to pass on that one. I, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, it's I mean, a good question. I guess I, I would probably go with David Lee Roth, but I, not that I like his voice, <laughs> but I thought it fit the band better. Sammy yeah, has a better voice, probably. Well, that's what I, I'm feeling, that, you know, David Lee Roth fit the band, but the better singer yeah. was, was the other. I would concur. I, I have the need to ask that to everybody because one of these days we're going to get an official judgment and all that, but everyone's got to realize that Dirty Dancing songs were written by rock guys who were famous at the same exact time that Van Halen was, yet nobody ever associates Van Halen and Dirty Dancing per se. Yeah, interesting. Interesting times. But, you know, Dirty Dancing, you know, the time of my life exists because of the movie. I mean, you know, that song would not, we wouldn't have written it, it wouldn't be a hit uh, because it was a, you know, it was a throwback. And, you know, there would have been no place on radio for it as a throwback to the 60s. So, you know, the marriage of it to the movie. Um, you know, but I, I, I beg to differ, John. Yeah. I beg to differ because, and I say this because, RCA Records, Mm -hmm. before the movie came out, a month before the movie came out, put out Time of My Life. It was 34 with a bullet. And RCA Records went to Vestron Films and said, where's your film? Oh, we didn't tell you, we moved it back a month. And so RCA said, well, we're gonna stop promoting the song. And so 
now time of my life, instead of having a bullet, it had an anchor. And it, <laughs> it fell off the charts. So without the movie, with them promoting it as Bill Medley, Jennifer Warman, time of my life, yeah. 34 with a bullet. And then yeah, it fell off the charts. And but then- would it, would it have kept going? I don't think it would have- Well, who knows, but the movie came out a month later and there was no record out. There was nothing. RCA hadn't printed a record yet. And within two weeks, 300,000 records were back ordered mm -hmm. because they went to see the movie and people love Time of My Life. And so Joe Public made this song, took this song off, off the ground and created, helped create the phenomenon. Wow. Right, but I, I, think, I, I think we agree then because what I've been saying was um, the, first, the movie brought people to, into the theater. Yes. And, and then the song, I think first the, the movie pushed the song and then I think the song pushed the movie. I, I, so well, I, you know, one without the other, you take out Patrick Swayze out of that equation, Jennifer, the little story that Eleanor wrote, you don't have the same phenomenon. You don't have this dirty dancing phenomenon that happened because it was the sum of the parts and them all aligning, the stars aligning. Very true. Wow. As Emil said one day to us, that Emil Ardolino, the director, he said it was just a confluence of things coming together that you couldn't have forced to happen. They just did. And, uh, uh, you know, it just took a, a life of its own, really. And here we are still talking Jesus, about it every yes. day today since then. <laughs> 33 years later, brother. Crazy. Exactly. It's really crazy. I want, I it's, almost, it's almost more popular now than ever. Sure. Because generations of people are added to the mix. And commercials. Right. It's in commercials. It's in right. movies. Right. You know, it, it's, it's this phenomenon, cultural event that not only happened in America, it happened around the world. Worldwide, yep. 55 million records later. Yep. <laughs> and it constantly gets kind of, um, you know, noted in a, in a, in a commercial or a, or a, um, a TV show or a yeah. movie. They're doing a, a phrase. Or, nobody puts baby in the corner. Oh, right. Right. Well, yeah. It's just constant. You know, there's, Which, there's uh, yeah. often one, once every couple of weeks, you get a reference somewhere. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you both so much for your time. Eventually, when you get the second panel, we'll tape another thing then. But in the meantime, just keep up all the greatness, both of you. Hey, listen, let me say one more time, rockcamp.com slash masterclass. It's for a great cause. Come see us tomorrow night, 8 o'clock. We'll get this posted before then. Thanks, uh, and have a wonderful rest of the day, both of you. All right, thanks, thanks a lot, buddy. Take care. Outrocast.